Hi there and welcome wherever you're watching from. I'm going to be talking about whose cognitive load is it anyway. I'm really excited to be here as part of PlatformCon and speaking on the Platform Culture track. I will be available on Slack so if you have any questions please feel free to post them in there and I'll do my best to answer. I'm also looking for some feedback and thoughts and comments on the topic so if you have any ideas please post them in and we can have a, a chat afterwards. So let me just get started. I'd like to start with a quick introduction. My name is Paula Kennedy. I am the co-founder of a company called Sintasso. We provide an open source framework called Kratix, which is specifically designed to help customers to run their internal platforms as products. So if you have any questions around that, then please feel free to post those into the Slack channel. But let me talk about the topic today. I'm going to be telling a story about how over the last few years, we've seen an ever increasing number of tools and technology choices. And we've also seen changes in working practices such as DevOps, which have all led to an increased cognitive load on developers. More recently, we've heard about how we should be reducing this cognitive load by improving developer experience with some sunshine and rainbows, as well as offering golden paths or paved paths to production to make developers' lives easier. So the key questions I'm going to raise and attempt to answer are, if we successfully reduce cognitive load for developers, does that mean that the load's just gone away? Or is it now someone else's cognitive load? So the first thing you might be asking is what actually is cognitive load? Cognitive load theory first began to be researched in the late 80s by John Sweller. And there's lots of information that you can find about it online. And there's different types of cognitive load. But for the purposes of this talk, here's a basic definition by Frederick Reif, who said that cognitive load involved in a task is really the amount of information processing required by a person to perform this task, which makes sense. But why should we worry about it? Well, De Jong stated that cognitive load theory asserts that learning is hampered when working memory capacity is exceeded. So in other words, if we have too much cognitive load, our working memory, the amount we can process, gets overloaded and we struggle to complete the tasks that we're working on. So how does this apply to us in our industry? Well, putting it simply, we work in a very complicated space. I don't need to tell you all. It feels like just when you've learned one new technology, along comes another one. There's always something new, something shiny. And every now and again, something comes along which promises to be the answer, the silver bullet. For example, going cloud native, taking advantage of everything the cloud has to offer. But just as an example, this is the latest cloud native computing foundation landscape. Now, I'm not going to stand here and criticize this, but you can see that there are so many technology choices available, so many tools, so many frameworks. There's just a huge amount to understand. And if you're trying to complete a task, then if you've first of all got to choose the right tool for the job, then you have to learn that tool. Then you have to figure out how to integrate it into your current tech stack. That's just a huge amount of cognitive load that has to be dealt with before you even get to the point of using the tool and trying to complete your task. And this is just one example. I could have put up the AWS service list or any other kind of choice of technologies. And as well as seeing the increasing number of tools available for us to choose from, we've also seen changes in ways of working. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on past ways of working, but probably most of you have heard of the old wall of confusion, where we had developers and operators working in separate teams. Developers would write their code, throw it over the mythical wall to the ops who are responsible for running it. Now, from a cognitive load point of view, this might seem quite reasonable for the developers because they can focus on their code and when it's written, they just pass it over. But we've seen this approach having a number of problems, particularly for the ops folks. So ops are responsible for keeping that code up and running. They're often on call to support that code, but they probably didn't write it and probably don't understand much of that code. So it's a very difficult situation. And in this model, you have the two teams very siloed and they've got different incentives. Developers want to release more features and get more functionality in the hands of customers. Operators need to keep the code up and running and they need to keep it stable. They want to have fewer releases. So there's not much empathy. There's not much collaboration. And it, this friction and tension causes progress to be slow. So to help solve this, we've seen the rise of DevOps over the last 12 years or so. So what is DevOps? Well, I attended a great meetup a little while ago from the London DevOps meetup group. And one of the organizers put up 
three different definitions of DevOps, just showing how the term has really grown to mean different things to different people. Now I did some Googling and tried to go right back to the beginning of the DevOps movement back in 2009 to see what those folks back then were thinking. And I found this awesome quote from Patrick Dubois from early 2010. Patrick said that the DevOps movement is built around a group of people who believe that the combination of both technology and attitude can change how we build and deliver software. Now, lots of folks have their own definitions of what DevOps means. For me personally, at its core, it's just about bringing developers and operators closer together, often into the same teams, so that you've got folks that are responsible for writing and running the code, and they have a shared understanding and shared empathy. I'm a big fan of the DevOps principle, particularly around this collaboration and sharing. But if you're part of a team that's being asked to use the best and shiniest technology, but not only to build software, but also to run it, that sounds like a huge amount of cognitive load. So what do we do about it? Well, I mentioned at the start a couple of trends we've seen emerging designed to help with this. So let's start by talking about developer experience or DevX. Another quick definition. So this one is from the fabulous James Governor at Redmonk, who said, developer experience is about creating an environment in which a developer can do their best work. DevX or DX is the context in which developer productivity can be unleashed and individual needs can be successfully balanced with those of the team. Which sounds awesome, right? Here's one of our developers. They're freed from toil and complexity. They have everything they need in their environment to get their job done. But what does that look like for them? Well, most likely this developer environment has got the tooling that they need, the abstraction levels, the credentials, the automation, the self-service experience so that the developer can get what they need when needed. And then the developers in turn can focus on writing the very best code and getting the features and value to their customers. So in other words, DevX is really about reducing cognitive load on developers so they can focus on their task at hand delivering value to customers. But how do we go about doing this? And if we reduce the cognitive load for the developers, does that mean it's just gone away? So I'm a huge fan of the book Team Topologies by Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pace. If you haven't read it yet, you definitely should. We absolutely love it. Santasta, we absolutely love their book. Uh, this is a picture of my copy of the book. In the book, they talk a lot about cognitive load and make some suggestions of how to manage it. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the whole of the book because uh, that would be a full talk on its own. In fact, a full book on its own. But in summary, uh, there were suggestions in the book around how to organize teams and kind of team APIs so that the teams have clear responsibilities and there's reduced friction across the team boundaries so that value can flow across the business more easily and get into the hands of customers. So why am I talking about it? Well, I want to just zoom in on the place where I've spent most of my career, and that's really around the platform team and platform space. So let's firstly define what we mean when we say platform. You've probably heard that word mentioned quite a lot over this conference, but let me pick my favorite definition from Evan Botcher, and it's a great way to think about platforms. So a digital platform is a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support, which are arranged as a compelling internal product. Autonomous delivery teams can make use of the platform to deliver product features at a higher pace with reduced coordination. Now, platform is one of those terms that gets used a lot, but you'll notice from this definition that there's not one specific technology that is defined as a platform. A, a platform can really be made up of anything. It could be a huge complicated system, which sadly is what often happens, or it could be a very small set of APIs that give the developers access just to the pieces that they need to build code. But whatever your platform looks like, we know that we need to make sure it provides a good developer experience. So here's a lovely representation of a delightful developer experience with some sunshines and rainbows and unicorns. Now, as per Evan Botcher's definition, we know that the platform needs to feel like a compelling internal product that the app teams can use autonomously. So you might be thinking that developer experience sounds like a good idea. And you might be wondering, how, how do we go about this? How do we offer this compelling product that the app teams can use? Now, the best way we know how to do this at Sintasso, and our experience working with many companies and, and platform teams, is to treat the platform as a product. So what's the definition for that, I hear you ask? Well, 
It was actually a little harder to find a short definition for platform as a product because it's really a sort of a shorthand term to describe a whole bunch of stuff. But I tried to write one myself. So let me share it and then I would love to hear feedback and what other people are thinking. So I tried to distill everything that I know about the topic into just a couple of sentences. Here's my best definition. A platform product meets the needs of the application teams. The platform team applies a product mindset to the platform. This includes product strategy, iterative development, frequent releases, a focus on developer delight, and it might have metrics such as user adoption or kind of revenue or savings per platform feature that's released. And what does it look like if we get this right? Well, if we if we get it right, then hopefully some of these quotes from the Puppet State of DevOps reports from 2020, 2021 become true. Application teams want to use the product, the platform, because it's been built to meet their needs and it makes it easy for them to get their work done. And done right, the internal platform helps organizations to scale DevOps. Now, is it enough to make sure that the platform meets the needs and the desires of the app teams? Well, not quite, because there's a few other business concerns that we also need to incorporate into the software. So another buzzword term we hear a lot is about paving the golden path. Now, I don't have a definition this time. I just have a lovely image. If you want to read more about it, there's some great blogs from the Spotify engineering team and also a great blog from Charity Majors from Honeycomb that talk about how they go about doing this. And I'll be sharing some links at the end so you can go and have a look at those. By offering golden paths to developers, we can do a couple of things. We can encourage them to use a reduced set of tools and technologies that are kind of preferred by the business, which can help reduce cognitive load even from choosing tool sets on the developers. And also, if we've got multiple teams using a similar set of tools, they can share best practices, they can share knowledge. Golden paths also can include extra things, extra guardrails that the business requires such as compliance or security scanning or monitoring, they can be incorporated into the path to production so that developers know if they follow that route, they have checked all the boxes and they can get to production faster, which isn't to say that we can't allow developers to choose the tooling that they want, but developers then need to understand that if they choose a different path, then they are responsible for supporting it. If they choose the kind of recommended paved path, then the platform team will support it. But now we get to the critical question. We know our developers have lots of tools and practices that they're trying to use to get the job done. We know that to reduce that cognitive load on them, they need to have a good developer experience. And it would be great if that experience included some paved paths to help them get to production as smoothly as possible. But this all sounds like a lot of work that we're trying to shift away from those developers to make their lives easier. And where's it all going? Who is doing the heavy lifting? Well, you might have guessed it, it's the platform team. So this team, or maybe even more than one team within your organization, this team has become responsible for providing the experience for the app teams. But as we've seen, there are so many parts to be incorporated as part of the platform. This puts a huge cognitive load on their plate. This is typically a team that is underinvested in and they have more and more things that they're being asked to do. And if there's people out there telling you that you can buy the platform off the shelf and that would do everything that you need, just beware. There's a whole conversation we could have about build versus buy. But even if you're using a a big cloud provider or big vendor, the needs of your business are still unique to you. There's still going to be a certain amount of work that has to be configured to incorporate everything that makes your business unique. And as we like to say at Sintasso, only you can build your platform. Only you know all the different pieces that have to be involved to wire together the platform that meets your business needs. So the answer to my question and slight warning to all of you is just beware of moving all the cognitive load onto the platform teams to give them too much to handle. Won't somebody please think of the poor platform engineers? And finally, with all the buzzword bingo that I've just been through, The question I want to finish with is, are we missing a piece of the puzzle? Shouldn't we also be thinking about platform team experience and making it easier for those platform teams to then create the platform, curate that experience for the application developers? So here's my list of further reading. You can have a look at some of these things. 
I will be available on Slack. So as mentioned, I would love to hear questions. I'd love to hear feedback. If you have a better definition for platform as a product, I'd love to hear that. And finally, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoy the rest of PlatformCom.